started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our little uh, discussion here all about creating a workout program. So I'm so excited to be here. I've heard a little bit about what you guys have been doing with the women's weightlifting series. And this is something that I'm super passionate about um, from a personal standpoint. So I'm so excited that I was invited here to speak to you guys today about kind of taking all of these tips that you've gotten and putting them into action. So to start with a little bit about me, uh, my name's Julie. I am a recent graduate of Scranton, proud alumni, wear Scranton gear everywhere I go. And people are like, oh, did you go to school with Michael Scott? Ha <laughs> ha. So you'll be hearing that for the rest of your life. Um, but I studied exercise science, graduated with my undergrad degree in 2019, went right into the Doctor of Physical Therapy program, which I just graduated from this past May. And over the course of my time at Scranton, I was involved in quite a bit. One of the things that I did was serve as the strength and conditioning coach for a few of the varsity teams on campus. So I spent a lot of time in the varsity weight room that I know you guys are spending some time in, which is really cool. I also worked in the gym on campus, um, like the main gym on Mulberry Street. So super familiar with the layout and hopefully that'll be helpful with the program that I made for you guys today. Currently, I'm living just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, working as a performance physical therapist for True Sports PT, and I specialize working with female athletes. So again, super pumped to be here because you guys are my favorite people to work with, uh, both in person and virtually. And then the last thing I do is I also host a mental and physical fitness podcast and am starting to create a bit of content. So just want to mention that in case you want to hear more from me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that a little more at the end. So today we're going to just dive into a few important considerations for designing a workout program. This will include kind of laying out things <clears throat> on a weekly span, as well as actually diving into some daily workouts. I did create a sample seven day workout program for uh, you girls, and we'll be sharing that with you guys. So you can totally use that in the gym if you want to. Then we're going to finish up talking about just a few recovery strategies because we cannot talk about fitness without talking about recovery. And then some tips from me about staying on track. Also, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask them or throw them in the chat. Maybe I'll see them, maybe we'll do them at the end, uh, but definitely don't hesitate because I absolutely love questions. So some key components to consider when creating a program is we want to make sure that we hit all of the major muscle groups within the span of a week. So just thinking about like upper body, lower body, whether or not you understand anatomy in depth or you kind of just have a general awareness of where certain muscles are. We want to make sure big picture we're kind of targeting everything at least once throughout a seven day period. Typically for me, three to four days of resistance training is going to be ideal to give enough of a stimulus to promote progress, but also allow enough time for recovery between sessions. Especially if you're a part of this group, you might be somebody who's kind of just getting started with lifting weights. Maybe you've been working out for a while, you played a sport in high school, so you're in shape and active. But if the weight training stuff is new to you, three to four days a week is plenty of time to create the adaptation that you're looking for. On top of that, 40 to five to 60 minutes is typically enough time in the gym, more than enough time to get the stimulus that you're looking for in order to progress. Anything more than that might just be kind of taking up extra time, pushing into fatigue. Not to say that longer workouts are bad, um, but 45 to 60 minutes is really all that you need to allow in order to improve your fitness. And then on top of that, anywhere from like six to eight exercises per workout is typically what I go for. One mistake that I made early on in my personal fitness, actually when I was at Scranton, is I would try to do as many different exercises as possible in the gym. And in reality, going an inch deep and a mile wide isn't really going to create the long-term um, muscle gains and fat loss and things that you're looking for. Focusing more specifically on a certain goal with just six to eight exercises and doing them really well is going to promote the most progress. From a personal standpoint, my workouts only have like five to six exercises in them right now, max, um, because those first like two to three that I'm doing, I'm giving a lot of my effort to. 
So some questions that you want to ask yourself when creating a workout program is how much time you have. Again, that 45 to 60 minutes is ideal, um, but take a look at your schedule. You know, maybe you have like a 90 minute break between classes, and that would be a great spot to fit a workout in because the gym's not as crowded and you're going to meet your friends for lunch after and there's not as many people taking up the weight side. Um, so think about like those things when you're planning when you're going to work out. Also thinking about what your goals are. So are you just looking to get more active and get stronger? That's an awesome goal. Um, or are you looking to lift a certain number of weight? Or are you looking to maybe lose a little bit of fat? All of these things, you just want to kind of get clear with what your why is before you dive into this. And then also what equipment you have access to. So I know the Scranton gym has some awesome equipment. Um, we're really lucky. Well, I shouldn't say we anymore. I'm not there. I feel like I am. Um, you guys at school are really lucky to have such a nice gym. So definitely take advantage of everything that there is to offer there um, and find a way to work a lot of it into your program. So when we think about creating a workout program, we can look at it on like a weekly level. So Sunday to Saturday, Monday to Sunday, whatever you want to do. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to split this up. So the pictures you're looking at are just some general templates that I found online. You can do total body programs where you're training all major muscle groups every time you go to the gym. You can do an upper body, lower body type of style where you might alternate upper, lower days. You can do a bodybuilding style split, which tends to be pretty popular. Um, that's what you're looking at on the bottom of the screen where you pick like more specific areas of your body and go hard in those. So chest and triceps, people that are doing those are going to be doing a lot of bench pressing in that workout. So for me specifically, I'm going to talk about the push pull workout split. This is the one that I created for all of you. And this is the one that I like to use personally, especially when I was getting started, I found that I was having the most success with this one. So when we think about exercise selection, this is one of the big questions is like, okay, I know how to do all these exercises, but how do I decide which ones go where and which ones I should do on which day? So just a few basic principles here, understanding the difference between compound exercises and isolation exercises. So compound exercises are those that use multiple muscle groups oftentimes are working at multiple joints in order to accomplish that movement. So in these photos here, that top right of me doing a Romanian deadlift, I hope you guys went over that one because I know you did some leg stuff. Yeah, awesome. Um, the RDL is gonna be one of our compound lifts because we're using the glutes, the hamstrings, we're using some core, we're using the back muscles. There's a lot going on there, which makes it a really awesome exercise. Compared to an isolation exercise, which targets a single muscle group, oftentimes a single joint in order to perform the movement. So in the bottom left here, you see me smiling through the pain. I think my boyfriend was making fun of me and that's why I'm laughing, uh, doing a bicep curl machine. So this one is working less total muscle in my body, but really zoning in on the biceps. When we think about maximizing muscle gains. And this might be actually growing muscle. This might just be simply getting stronger and performing better. We want to think about optimizing motor unit recruitment and time under tension. So without getting too much into the physiology here, all that that really means is we want to recruit or essentially use as many muscle fibers as possible in order to promote adaptation which makes sense, right? Like if you want your muscle to grow stronger, you want as much of it to be working and ready and in the game as possible. And time under tension refers to how much total time in your 45 minute session are your muscles actually under load. We know that in order to get stronger, gain muscle, lose fat, change your body composition, you need to be stressing the tissue. That's how we get stronger. We break things down and then our body builds it back up. So maximizing the time spent with that muscle burning, actually performing the movement is also very advantageous. Oftentimes we think about this in terms of like tempo. So 
For example, when I was doing the RDLs up in the top right, on this specific day, I was going very slowly on the way down, trying to take like six to 10 seconds going down. So I was really spending time stretching out my hamstrings and glutes. All of those 10 second repetitions added up to create more time under tension, which left me a lot more sore, but also allowed for more stimulus to those muscles to get stronger. So think about those two things when you're working out. And then just a general framework for creating an actual daily program. I like to do anywhere from like two to three compound exercises per session. So those are gonna be our barbell movements, our heavy dumbbell movements, our squats, Romanian deadlifts, normal deadlifts, bench press, overhead press. Some of these I know you guys have learned, some of them maybe you haven't gotten into yet, but those are those big muscle group exercises that give us a lot of bang for our buck. But there definitely is still a place for isolation and accessory exercises. So three to four of those tends to be enough to create that you know total body stimulus and create a nice workout for you. And the last note I'll mention here is that in general, selecting free weight exercises over using machines is also going to give you more bang for your buck. As you can see here, I'm doing both. This is a bicep curl machine and there are advantages to using machines at certain times. Won't get too much into the weeds here, but in general, using free weights draws more muscle, re muscle recruitment, creates more muscle tension, simply because it's harder. When I was doing these bicep curls with the machine, all I had to do was bend my elbows. Everything was in the right place. The machine was doing all the work for me in terms of positioning. So I was able to do a lot more weight. Maybe I can curl like 60 pounds on this, but with dumbbells, I might only be able to curl 40 pounds because it's a harder movement to be able to like keep the form, which makes it better. So that could be a whole nother conversation in and of itself, but try to have a, a balance of both and primarily bias towards free weights. Now getting into exercise order. When you're creating a workout program, you're, you're hopping into the fitness center for your 45 minute session. You wanna start with the most demanding exercises. Now demanding can mean a multitude of things. Demanding might be physically demanding. Top right corner here, I'm hitting some front squats to overhead press, which in CrossFit language is a thruster. Those are really demanding for me, they're hard. So I'm making like a very unattractive muscly face in this photo because it was difficult. And for me, this was the first exercise that I did after my warm up because I'm the most fresh. My muscles have the most energy. My nervous system is primed and ready to go. I have the most resources. Now, the other component here is starting with the most technique focus exercises. So maybe specifically for you, you're learning and kind of figuring out your technique on a back squat. Like it doesn't feel great yet. You're excited to do it. You're jumping into it, but you really have to focus on like staying upright or keeping your knees in line with your toes or keeping your core tight. Like whatever it is that you have to think about. If there's an exercise that really requires a lot of conscious attention and focus, put that early in the workout because you're simply gonna be tired later in the workout and it's a lot harder to maintain that mind-muscle connection and really focus on that cognitive task when you're already tired. So do the hard stuff first, okay? We also wanna think about compound exercises being in the beginning of our workout and then those isolation exercises being towards the end for all of those same reasons. So in these pictures, we have the front squat up top, a bench press, actually a decline bench press on the bottom. That's another compound movement that's gonna be early on in the workout. And then the bottom right is a tricep extension. That's gonna be something coming later on because it's not using nearly as much muscle tissue and nervous system requirement and mental focus as the bench press is for me. So I hope that makes some sense. Now, another big question here is where does cardio belong in the workout? So if you're somebody who wants to perform cardio on the same days that you resistance train, 
I don't think that's a bad idea at all. It definitely can be done. However, you want to make sure that one isn't impacting the other if there's one that's a priority. So what I mean by that is if you're coming in and it's leg day and your focus is that you want to squat more weight than you've ever squatted before, you don't want to fatigue yourself too much on cardio beforehand because you simply won't have all of that energy in the tank to perform well on your squats. So for that reason, I always start with cardio as a warm up. You know, hop on the elliptical, the rower, the bike, five or so minutes just to get my heart rate up. But I don't want to do it to the point where I'm tired because then that's going to get in the way. So if you want to get 20 minutes of treadmill walking in just to burn some extra calories, maybe put that at the end of your workout. However, on the contrary, if your focus is cardio, if you're training for a half marathon right now and you're like, man, I want to keep my strength up. I want to keep resistance training, which you definitely should do if you're a runner. But if the priority is a three mile run on the treadmill, start with your three mile run, get that done, give your energy to that, and then use whatever's left to get your resistance training in. So here's just a little weekly split talking about that push pull, and I'll go into an exercise um, progression that you can use each day. So this is just a general rule of thumb. We've got Monday, upper body push, Tuesday, lower body push, Thursday, upper body pull, Saturday, lower body pull. Now I picked these days specifically to have rest days and recovery days in between. However, this is totally dependent on your schedule. I know some students have like all of their classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, maybe they have like one class. So if that's you, put your workouts on the days that you're less busy. Like that makes sense, right? Adjust this accordingly. And then same thing with weekends. Like if your weekends allow for workouts, great, put one in there. Um, but if your weekends tend to consist of events and activities and poor decisions that don't quite correspond with a good workout, then perhaps get your workouts in during the week. It's just a general rule of thumb here and more on that at the end. But in general, allowing at least one rest day for every two to three training days is going to be a good rule of thumb for allowing enough time for recovery. So let's dive into each of these workouts. So for our day one lower body push, what this whole push pull thing means is it's talking about the act of pushing something with your body. What muscles are you using primarily? So think about if there's like a really heavy box on the floor or maybe a couch. Maybe you and your, your housemates have to move a couch because you had a party and it's really sticky underneath the couch and you got to move it to clean it. When you're pushing that couch, your arms are straightening. You're coming down into a squat and probably pushing, extending your knees. So that movement of pushing is your push muscles, primarily muscles on the front of your body, your shoulders, your chest, your quads, your calves, and amongst all the other muscles too, but that's kind of the priority. So that's what we think of when we separate push versus pull, where if you're pulling something heavy, that's gonna be more of your back muscles, your glutes, your hamstrings, muscles on the back side of your body. Very general framework of looking at it. So looking at this lower body push, we've got seven total exercises, starting with cardio and muscle activation, um, in terms of warming up, there's so many different ways to warm up, but what I will say to you is make sure you do it. Try your best not to just walk into the gym and go right to the squat bar. Very few people are going to maximize their success by doing that. Now, if you're crunched for time and you're just trying to get it in, it's going to happen occasionally, but if you can spend a few minutes warming up on cardio and then maybe doing some band work, maybe doing some body weight squats just to practice the movement, if you're interested in more of my thoughts on warming up, I did record a podcast on this, shameless plug. Um, feel free to check it out, but definitely do something five to 10 minutes. Now, looking quickly at this, I'll, I won't read off every single exercise just for the sake of time, um, but notice how those bigger muscle group, barbell, compound, sexy exercises are in the beginning. We've got our squat. So many different ways to squat. I love that you dove into, in one of your sessions, um, all the different variations. 
pick which one feels best for you. I love all of them. I personally love front squats, but get your squats in first. Give a nice effort to those squats. Followed by that, we have our hip thrusts. So you can use a barbell, you can use a dumbbell, you can use a kettlebell. But again, that's a relatively large muscle group movement, your glutes and your hamstrings to perform that. And then as we go down, things kind of get a little bit more simplified. Now that doesn't mean that they get easier. You wanna make sure that your calf raises are also challenging. However, they're not gonna use as much nervous system and metabolic demand as the squats and the hip thrusts, right? Um, we've got a rear foot elevated split squat in there. Did you guys go over the rear foot elevated or Bulgarian split squat? Yeah. Okay, good. Make sure you're doing those on leg day, ladies. We love to hate them, but they are one of the best exercises out there um, for lower body development. And then any of these other exercises, if you're not quite sure what they are, feel free to look them up. Um, now, sets and reps wise, you can totally do what's comfortable for you. When I'm programming for somebody who's relatively new to strength training, I typically go for three sets and somewhere between like eight to 10, 10 to 12 reps. It tends to be a nice sweet spot where it's not too much, but it's enough to kind of get enough repetitions in to really learn the movement and get that motor learning going on. So feel free to adjust this as you wish. Um, that's a nice kind of general framework. Moving on to upper body push, we're thinking our pressing muscles, right? Pressing activities. So we've got the bench press, we've got the push press, and then again, things kind of get smaller and more isolated. Um, dumbbell front raise and lateral raise, that's some of that more isolated shoulder work, triceps, push-ups, do your push-ups too, ladies, great exercise. Um, and then typically on my upper body days is when I'll incorporate a little bit more core work because upper body days are a little bit less strenuous in terms of like total body muscle working. So that's kind of a nice place to squeeze it in. But that being said, I don't have a lot of core specific exercises on this program. So if you're somebody who enjoys doing, you know, some extra planks or setups or what have you, um, just kind of throw that in, you know, wherever you see fit. Bear crawls, ladies, try them, do them, so good. Then for day three, we've got our upper body pull. Uh, so this is gonna be pulling down, pulling back. We've got a bent over row, which you can do with all kinds of different equipment. Pull-ups, oh man, pull-ups are so hard. I've been working on getting a pull-up for quite a while now and I still can't do it, but we're slowly getting there with some different um, assisted methods that I've been trying. So definitely get some kind of pull-up into your upper body days. I know Scranton has a nice assisted pull-up machine in the main gym, which I used for years, literally all seven years I was there, I was hitting that machine. So definitely use it. Um, it's a really, really good one. And then again, working more into like biceps, kind of those posterior shoulder muscles, a little bit of core work at the end here. And then another note that I forgot to mention that's been in the other ones too, is if you're somebody who's looking for a little bit of an increased cardio stimulus, if you're looking to get your heart rate up in your workouts, if you're somebody who likes, you know, classes like Orange Theory or F45, where like you're sweating the whole time, you can get a relatively similar stimulus by using something called supersets. So what that means simply is, let's say for exercises three and four here, you do your set of bicep curls, eight or 10 or 12 reps, and then without taking a rest or maybe taking a very short rest, you go right into your rear delt fly, which is that bent over extending backwards and cycle through those two exercises so when one muscle is working, the other muscle is resting, but you're not resting because you're doing the exercise. So your heart rate stays up. Pretty cool way to do it. Um, there are definitely time and places for it, but just want to throw that in there as a useful tool. And then lastly, we've got our lower body pull. So this is going to be picking things up off the ground, using your glutes and your hamstrings. Now the deadlift there is some debate in the fitness industry, as there is debate in the fitness industry about everything, about where do deadlifts belong? Is it, should it be performed with your back exercises? Should it be with your leg exercises? 
The answer is, it doesn't really matter. You can put deadlifts wherever you see fit. Some people like to just do deadlifts as their own workout entirely because they are pretty freaking hard. That's cool too. Wherever you can get them in, get them in. It's so cool that Scranton has a hex bar. And I know there is one in the fitness center as well. That's a really great way to learn how to deadlift. It's definitely a lot easier to perform than with the barbell. Um, but I hope you ladies will work your way up to a barbell deadlift as well. I like to do them with my leg exercises, but you can decide for yourself. Um, and then we've got some other, you know, kettlebell swings. We have a single leg RDL. Another thing to mention is just from like an injury prevention standpoint. So this is my, my PT self-talking single leg exercises are crucial to creating a well-rounded program and preventing, helping to prevent injuries. Um, when you're doing all double leg exercises, you're missing some of the benefit of single leg work that just helps to give you that more well-rounded approach. So definitely try to work in some single leg things as well. You'll notice that the hip thrust is on both leg days because they kind of cross into both a push and a pull. And honestly, hip thrusts are great. Every girl's looking for some booty gains. If you're here, I'm sure you are. Hip thrusting twice a week will definitely help with that. So it's on here too. Um, and then some other, you know, more isolation work. Again, if you have questions, feel free to ask me or just look it up on YouTube. There's so many different tutorials for all of these exercises. Or ask, you know, your wonderful ladies, Sarah and Steffi, I'm sure they could help you as well. So as we kind of wrap up here, talking about recovery, oh man, recovery is so key to success in the gym. And this is something that I did not pay any mind to when I was in college. Um, Cause how could you? Like everything that you do in college goes against proper <laughs> recovery. So it's really hard, but doing what you can to promote it as best as possible will definitely be helpful. So. Nutrition is so important. I would love to come back again in the future and talk more about nutrition and some general principles to follow. But all that you should really know is that nutrition is the building block to growth. Look at this little girl on the screen. She's so cute and so happy and she's building blocks and she's having a great time. That is you building your muscles one block at a time. But in order to do that, you need the blocks. Like, you need the resources to give to your quads, to give to your glutes, to give to your muscles to repair themselves. And it's also really important to do that so that your body knows that you're trying to keep muscle and that you wanna lose fat. One thing that they've seen in research is if you are working out and working out and working out and not eating well and not sleeping well, is that your body's gonna lose weight if you are in a deficit However, you're much more likely to give up muscle tissue if you're not fueling properly rather than fat mass, which when you're trying to lose weight, ideally you're looking to lose fat. Um, that was a tangent. Just make sure you're eating enough, eating well, protein, but also eat what you want when it is appropriate because I spent many a nights at Scranton Pizzeria and I don't regret it. Um, sleep, guys, sleep. Oh my God, so important. I didn't sleep in college. I stayed in the library until like 2.30 in the morning before all my physics exams. And, you know, if I could go back and change that, I probably would, probably would. Seven to eight hours per night is what we're looking for. You're not gonna get that every night, but when you can, do it. When you have the opportunity to, do it. From a very basic standpoint, there's two main stages of sleep that are most important for muscle recovery and just overall health. REM sleep is where your brain learns. It's where you store the memories that you have from the day. It's an emotional and mental reset period for your brain. And it's also where your body kind of stores these movements into long-term memory. So if you're somebody right now who is really trying to get better at squatting or deadlifting or split squatting or bench pressing, your brain literally stores these things away when you're sleeping. So keep that in mind. And then deep sleep is important for building muscle, tissue repair. This goes for all tissues in your body. It's so cool what our body does when we're unconscious. Um, and then immune function too. So everybody's like getting sick in college right now because all of our immune systems are shot. So 
sleeping is literally the best thing you can do for immune health. And then active recovery is something that I put on the program for you girls, because there are so many ways that you can still move your body, feel like you're moving in the right direction, give yourself those flush of feel good hormones while still respecting the ability for your muscles to repair. So my favorite things for active recovery are doing some kind of yoga or stretching. There's so many YouTube videos that have great, you know, little, um, yoga flows. I know Scranton also offers like yoga classes and stuff. Even once a week would be awesome. Outdoor walks, my favorite thing in the whole wide world. I go for one every morning. I love to do them at night too. Like seven minutes, I take a walk around the block. I've got my cup of tea. I'm feeling myself and it's so great. It helps me feel good and it helps my body kind of get some blood flow without it being really demanding. Foam rolling is another great thing you can do either with your workouts or outside of your workouts. And then things like breath work, meditation, mindfulness. Um, I could go on forever, but any of those things would be great if you can incorporate them. Now, a big thing to talk about when we're talking about recovery is alcohol. And I have a question for you ladies, those of you who are listening. Do we think after a night out, when you wake up the next morning and you're like, man, I drank a lot of calories. I ate like crap. Should I go to the gym today? What do you guys think? Like, should you train after a night out or should you not train? Or does it not really matter? I want to hear somebody's thoughts here. Um, I personally like guilt myself into being like, oh my God, I had so many calories. I should go, but I don't know whether that's actually correct or not, (laughs) but that's what I do. Mm, Well, you are definitely not alone in that thought process. I have also felt that way. Uh, I see a thumbs down from Marilena and I I like that girl. I like that. So I'm going to tell a little story here and then we're almost done. Um, So this is a picture of me with my Scranton pals last year, post-graduation. I was in grad school, but we all got together in Philly. We're on the Rocky steps. I know so cheesy. This guy... (laughs) this guy was like do you guys want a picture and I hand him my phone and everybody's like Julie he's gonna steal your phone like what are you doing but he took a picture of us and he told us to do this and we all did it so that's why we're flexing um but the story here so got to Philly at like 12 o'clock and we just had a day you know we went to brunch we had the mimosas we went to my friend's apartment we had a little party We didn't stay out super late at night, but we had like a steady flow of beverages throughout the day. Quite a few. Had an absolute blast. The most interesting thing though is by the time we got home and went to bed, it was honestly only like 11 o'clock maybe. And I really wasn't intoxicated anymore at this point. Like I wasn't feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to bed drunk. What I'm about to show you is the data that I got from a fancy band that I wear on my wrist called the Whoop, uh, which is for another time. But it tells you all about your sleep quality and your body's response to what you did the day before. Now, I didn't tell Whoop that I drank. Whoop just measures all these things inside of my body. Um, So when I woke up the next morning and I looked at my sleep, what I saw after a day of drinking is that I slept for six hours and 22 minutes which like sounds pretty solid. It's like, all right, it's not bad. When you look at the bottom of this here, it says that my time in bed was seven hours and 56 minutes. What this tells us is that I was laying, not in a bed on a couch, but I was sleeping for seven hours and 56 minutes. Like I was still, I was chilling. That's how my whoop knows that I was in bed. But only six hours of that eight hours was actually spent in sleep. So when you drink alcohol, and even if you just have a couple of drinks and you're not like totally bombed, your body does not enter true sleep because it's spending so much time and resources getting rid of the alcohol. When you go to sleep, your body doesn't want to digest. It doesn't want to get rid of toxins. It it doesn't want to focus on that. So this whole point here is like my sleep was crap, even though I actually got what we think of as eight hours. Now, the other thing that Whoop tells you is your recovery score. 
1% to 100%. 100% is like, man, based on your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your heart rate variability, and your sleep, you crushed it. You are 100% ready to push yourself today. I want you to go get after it. That's 100%. And then there's a whole spectrum of where you might lie on that thing. So I wake up on this morning and my whoop gives me my recovery score. And I was shocked to see 1%. This is whoop basically being like, hey man, we kept you alive, but we didn't do anything else that we were supposed to do while you were sleeping because you had too much alcohol in your system. Look at my metrics here, guys. I don't know how big this is on your screen. My resting heart rate, resting heart rate was 109. That's like running a marathon. Like that's like aerobic status right there. 109. My body was really working hard while I was sleeping because it was flushing all this out. My heart rate variability, which is a fancy measure of how well your body is able to adapt to stress. Um, typically, I'm around like 130, 140, even higher now. My HRV was six. That means that my heart rate was like taking like a metronome when in reality, it should really be like fluctuating. Basically, guys, it was just an absolute mess, right? I woke up the next morning feeling like crap. And of course, you, you wake up feeling that way and you're like, oh man, I should go work out. Like, and I totally get it. But the reason why I'm showing you this is because my body, my nervous system, my muscles, my heart did not get a chance to recover last night, which means that if I were to go and exercise today, I'm essentially just tearing down the wall more than I tore down yesterday. So after a night of drinking, after a night of having fun with your friends, listen, you need to have those nights. You need to have fun. But when you wake up the next day, the priority should be recovery. Go take a walk. Go get some sunshine. Maybe, maybe, maybe some very low intensity cardio, like ride a bike, go on the elliptical. But when you drank, picture like a nice, a nice wall, a nice, I don't know, brick wall. You tore that shit down. And overnight, your body was trying to build it back up and put the pieces together. If you were to go into the gym and work really hard again in that poor recovered state, you're just going to tear down the wall all over again. And that process over and over and over again is why so many people plateau or so many people have trouble making progress after weeks or months of working out because their body's not getting a chance to rebuild that wall. And then you go ahead and put it to use. So that was a little bit of a long-winded uh, discussion around recovery, but it's so important, girls. You're going to benefit so much more from taking that Sunday off. Go for a hot girl walk, like get your Starbucks, do your thing. And then Monday, go get after it after a good night's sleep. But if you work out Sunday on an empty tank, Monday's workout's going to suck and Tuesday's workout's going to suck. And then you're going to fail your physics test. And then like, it's all going to, compound um so recover sorry for yelling at you guys but i really i wish i wish i knew i wish i knew as we wrap up here a couple tips to stay consistent track your workouts and your progress this is something that i had so much fun doing when i was an undergrad and i mean i will say part of it is because i'm a big nerd when it comes to this stuff and i really enjoyed kind of tracking my numbers but this little workout journal is 17 bucks I know, kind of crazy on the college budget, but it has these pages, which I took a picture here. This is like an old screenshot from my Instagram. I don't even know what it says, um, but you write down your exercises, your sets, your reps, and you even write down little notes about how you felt. Let's see if I can read it. Something about hamstring curls feeling good. I don't know, but it was really fun to kind of flip through here. Um, and there's just something about writing down what you're doing. like paying that mindful attention that is so rewarding each time that you're in the gym. It's it's really honestly motivating. So track your workouts. Uh, train with a friend, get a workout buddy, find another girl in this group who has a break between biology and theology at one o'clock and wants to go to the gym before all the boys crowd around the bench press. Like figure that out and then stick to that routine. You know, tell yourself like, okay, 
on Mondays at one o'clock, I go to the gym and I do my lower body push day. And on Wednesdays, I go at eight o'clock in the morning before I start my day and try your best to stick to it. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to have some weeks that are busier. Give yourself grace. But if you can at least stick to a routine some of the time, it's going to be so much easier than being like, oh, should I work out today? When should I work out? Do I have time? Like make the time for it and everything else will fill in accordingly. And then last but not least, prioritize your rest days. It's really, it's where all the magic happens. It's where all the progress lies. And most importantly, have fun. Um, this is me, a screenshot of a video of me trying to do a pull-up and failing and posting it on my Instagram. And I was laughing because I was like, haha, so fucking hard, but I love it anyway. So like, have a good time. Like, it's really easy to kind of focus on your weaknesses, um, focus on things that you're not good at, but like, do the things you enjoy, do the workouts you like. If you really, really hate bench pressing with a barbell, like, fine, grab some dumbbells and get after it. Like, do what you enjoy, because that's what's going to allow you to stick to it. So last but not least, thank you guys. That's all I have on my little PowerPoint here. I really hope this was helpful. A couple of ways that you can reach me. I would love, love, love a follow on the gram. I'm just shy of a thousand followers right now. If you want to help a girl out, that'd be pretty cool. Um, on my Instagram, I post all kinds of like fitness content, uh, starting to get into a little more physical therapy stuff, mindset. I uh, post a gratitude list every day. It's really, it's a pretty intimate look at my life, uh, which I'm really proud of sharing. You can also shoot me an email if that's more your style. Slide into the DMs though. I love that. And then uh, last but not least, I've got a podcast. If you are interested in learning more about health and wellness and fitness and mindset, or if you just want to hear my crazy voice again, uh, check me out on the Goal Set Mindset podcast. I've had some pretty cool guests. I actually have an episode all about, um, you know, women, strength training, and being proud to be a female athlete, if you want to scroll back and find that. But I would love, love, love to connect with each and every one of you. If you have any questions along the way, don't hesitate to reach out. Like I mentioned, I work with people just like you every single day, and I absolutely love it. So don't be a stranger and thank you so much for having me on. If anybody has any questions, I would absolutely love to answer them.